Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 350. I'm going to be a bit naughty. Don't tell anybody. Attention, gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hi. Thanks so much for spending some of your holiday with me. If you're listening the day this show releases, that is. It's Christmas morning. For all who celebrate, I wish you a marvelous day honoring all your family traditions that make this time so special. And for all of us, whether you recognize this holiday or not, I think the spirit that comes with Christmas, the one of love and giving, is something to celebrate today and all year through. I'm doing something a little bit special with this episode. There are no promotions and just a little bit of learning because how can I not when we have such an expert with us? You may remember Heidi from last year. Once again, she'll be sharing an excerpt from her new book. This year, it's Underneath the Christmas Tree. We're also getting a behind-the-scenes look at her holiday traditions, her life as an author, and her advice on storytelling. This episode is full of marvelous surprises, so you're in for a real treat. Grab a mug of steaming coffee or whatever fits your fancy, and let's hear from my dear friend, Heidi. In the spirit of the season, it is my honor to welcome back Heidi Swain to the show. She was our special guest the week of Christmas last year, Anne has agreed to be with us again on Christmas Day, no less, to share some holiday cheer. Although passionate about writing from an early age, Heidi acquired a degree in literature and flirted briefly with a newspaper career before plucking up the courage to join a creative writing class and take her literary ambitions seriously. A lover of vintage paraphernalia and the odd bottle of fizz, she now writes feel-good fiction with heart for Simon & Schuster. Her debut novel, The Cherry Tree Cafe, was published in July 2015, and since then, she's had another 12 books published, becoming a Sunday Times bestseller in 2017. Heidi is currently celebrating the release of her 2021 festive title, Underneath the Christmas Tree, and writing The Summer Fair, which will be published next spring. Heidi, Merry Christmas, and welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me back. It's lovely to be here, and especially today, this really, really special day. kind of had a bit of a gasp moment when you gave my intro there. Have I really written that many books in that amount of time? <laughs> You have. <laughs> it always takes me by surprise. <laughs> I know, 12 books. And that's surprising even to you? Always. It really is. I have my books stacked up on a bookcase next to my bed. So it's the first thing that I see when I wake up in the morning. Kind of an incentive to get out of bed and get back to the keyboard because there's always a deadline. I kind of look at them in wonder and think, how have I done that? How have I managed to do all of that in this short amount of time? I don't know, but somehow it keeps happening. Thank goodness. It does. And I have to tell you, I have your books stacked in my bedroom too. (laughs) Remember the Instagram post you did that showed the order that you wrote the books? Yes. That's how I'm reading. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Except that I have to integrate in the holiday ones because I want to read those during the holiday. So I have to then jump a little bit. But I guess that's okay. That's okay because they've all got a different main character. So you can read them on their own and get all those lovely holiday feels in there. If you know if it's got Christmas on the cover on one of my books, then it's going to have Christmas on the pages too. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, let's start as I always traditionally have with a motivational candle. And I know you did one last time, but I think you have another one prepared for us, don't you? I do. And, you know, when I thought about this, this one really took me by surprise because the colour of the candle that kept coming back to me is not a colour that I am particularly drawn to, but it's a yellow candle. 
a really bright, bright yellow candle. You know, it's really bright even before it's lit. And it's got a very strong lemony scent, um, energizing kind of scent. Yeah, that really took me by surprise that that came into my head. Wow. Why do you think that is? I think really I need a bit of energy at the moment. We're at the end of the year now. It's been a busy year. And so I kind of, I need that energy to keep pushing me on, I think. In my head, I was just getting the words, keep going. That's interesting that this isn't a color you would gravitate to. By the way, Heidi, yellow is my favorite color. All shades, every way except for neon. (laughs) So maybe I was like coming into your mind or something and you just didn't know it. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I think maybe I was channeling Sue. That's what it was. You were influencing me there. But yeah, you know, it's always interesting to embrace something a bit different. So I kind of feel as if, I don't know, if you're inspired by something that doesn't usually appeal to you, I think you just kind of need to go with it because it's there for a reason. Yeah. And yellow is known for joy and happiness and everything uplifting, which that's, I think, what we are all needing right now. Definitely. And we've got it for the holiday season, of course. Do you have a saying or a quote or anything that would go with your yellow candle? It was literally, it was just those two words. It was just encouraging me to, it was keep going. Just keep going, keep doing what you're doing and you'll get there, you'll make it. Because it's been a hard writing year this year. Lots of other things going on as well. So yeah, I just needed that kind of lovely yellow boost just to tell me to keep going. Keep going. And then when you wake up in the morning and see your stack of books, you see why it's worth it. Exactly. Keep going creates big things, all these books. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. All right. So I want to talk Christmas with you, Heidi. What about candles in relation to Christmas? Now you're over in the UK. Lots of our listeners are there, but also in America, probably the majority in America. What do candles mean for Christmas over there? We have lots of candles over here. Well, we certainly do in my house anyway. I like a scented candle. I like a a cinnamon or a ginger scented candle because as much as we'd like to, we can't keep the mulled wine on the hob all the time, can we? Uh, Maybe we could. (laughs) You're going to dispute that. Okay. (laughs) We have a lot of scented candles to create the mood. And we just love that candle light in the evenings. We have a lot of twinkling lights. Yeah, candles are just lovely. You put one in the window, perhaps you're remembering family who are no longer here, lighting up the hearth. They're wonderful. We love them. Mm-hmm. And for Christmas decor, do you use like the traditional colored candles or what's happening over for you specifically this year? Like right where you're sitting right now. Okay, well, we have a lot of red and green candles because I like to bring a lot of greenery into the house, holly and mistletoe and ivy. So, yeah, that looks really lovely, beautiful, tall red and green candles and white ones, too, but predominantly red and green. Okay, so very traditional. Very traditional. Give us another little peek into your house. So you're sitting there right now. It's Christmas morning. Do you have anything to drink while we're sitting and chatting? Just tea in the morning. I just have tea, but we always, for breakfast, we love to have smoked salmon with scrambled egg or poached egg and some nice whole grain granary toast. That's a real tradition for us that we established years ago. So we love to have that. And then later on in the morning, we'll maybe have a little something fizzy before we sit down for dinner. And we always eke out the present opening. We have sacks first thing. Sacks are opened early, even though the kids are grown up. And then the main presents are opened after lunchtime. We like to kind of eke it out so it lasts the whole day that way. So when you say sacks, is that like what we would think of as stockings? Yes. But my kids are grown up, but they both still have theirs and they are pillowcases. So they're pillowcases with ribbons threaded through a little channel that I sewed into the top. And yeah, that's what they have full of prezzies. I love that. So my kids are also grown up, but I think I'm the biggest kid at Christmas. My son says, Mom, you act like you're 10 years old at Christmas. (laughs) Of course. And Santa Claus still comes and they get their stockings and then we open the presents. And it's just, I love that tradition, even though it doesn't resonate on a religious end to the holiday. But it just feels like the innocence and happiness and joy and warmth of being around family, even when there's no little ones, just continuing doing those things that we've done for so many years. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, as I say, the kids are grown up, but we still have those same traditions. 
I love yesterday. I love Christmas Eve almost as much as Christmas Day. With gingerbread men are always made on Christmas Eve. And there's always a mince pie and a glass of whiskey and a carrot and everything that goes out on the hearth. Always read the night before Christmas. It's just lovely to keep embracing all those traditions, no matter how old everybody is and all being all together. I agree with you there totally. And that's fun getting a little peek into the types of things you do on Christmas Eve, too. We started a new tradition. I'm going to say it's about four or five years ago. So it's kind of a more adult created tradition. But I know when little ones start emerging in the family, we'll be doing it, too. We do now on Christmas Eve a gingerbread making contest. So depending on how many people there are right now, we just do two different gingerbread houses. And it ends up being this whole thing. Like everyone has the same base elements and there are rules. And we create our gingerbread houses and then we put them up on Facebook and have everybody vote on which ones are the nicest, which is their favorite. So that's always fun. A little competition, a little fun. The girls lose every year. I don't know why. We're the most creative. (laughs) I have never made a gingerbread house. Well, that's something maybe to think about. In a way, I'm not going to say we're cheating because we don't want it to have to last and take forever. So we buy the pre-created gingerbread, like the walls and the roof and all of that. It's more in the decoration and the theming and what other things you add to it. And that's really what we're competing on. And if anyone wants to see what we did last night, it's on Facebook for everybody to vote on to see what we did. Well, we've broken the teams up differently each year. But I think with the girls, we try to be more out of the box and creative and the guys stay traditional. And that's why they're winning. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think you're probably right because, yeah, at Christmas time, that's what people tend to go for, isn't it? It's the tried and tested and the traditional. Yeah, maybe next year you can stuff them and you can go mega traditional and then you'll win. Yeah, <laughs> you never know. Well, jury's still out. We're still voting on this year's, so we'll see what happens. We usually go till about the afternoon of Christmas Day and then we take a peek at what it is. And it's all in fun. It's all just a great thing for us to do to be together, which is the important part of the holiday, of course, anyway. It's snowing here in Chicago, so we're getting a white Christmas. What's happening over there? It's a gray day, which is disappointing. I would love a white Christmas, you know, and I always manage to get a bit of snow in my books, even though we might not get it. You know, this is fiction, isn't it? So I'm allowed to indulge my passion for snow because I love snow. All right. Well, I'm going to send you some snow. You watch in about an hour, look out your window, and I'm going to have a, at least a snowflake or two coming your way. Don't miss it. I would love that. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about storytelling before you get into the gift that you're giving all of us today. I was mentioning to you a little bit before I pressed record that the prior episode of the podcast, we were talking about storytelling for business. In other words, business owners, not just presenting the products that they make and that they're available to sell, but the story behind different facets of the business, like why they started their business, maybe one of the products that they like making the most, or maybe they have a special product that reminds them of a family member or that they love going out and selling at craft shows. I mean, there are so many topics that you can build a story around. But I think that we still struggle with making our stories resonate, maybe would be the right word, with our readers, where it's bright and colorful and (laughs) all of that. So I thought maybe you could provide some guidance and help for us on storytelling and how you, in your books, make it just come alive. Because I love all the characters. I told you before that I've been pacing myself with the books because I don't want them to run out. (laughs) So it's my special time when I get to read one of your books. But what ideas do you have for us for writing and storytelling? I think one of the most important things you can do is to make it really personal. If you can make it personal and if you can explain something about the inspiration behind a product, then that makes it really authentic for people and that will definitely resonate. I put a lot of myself into my books. There are a lot of my memories in there. Um, There's some of my personality traits and things. And I really think that if you've experienced something and you can put that into the product and you can explain that to people, I think that's 
really, really useful. And I would also say to don't ignore the senses. If you've got something that smells good or feels good, that's something that you really want to highlight. If something's particularly tactile, you want to be able to describe that. I think you don't want to be too flowery with your words. There needs to be a limit, but I think the more you can describe something and the more you can make it personal, I think the more appealing it would be. Yeah, so by way of example, maybe if someone was talking about being at a craft show, maybe they don't just say, I got there at 7 a.m., set up my booth, everything looks perfectly in place, and now we're ready to go, come visit. Maybe instead you say, oh, it's a chilly morning, but we're here. I'm excited about the show. This is one of my favorite ones for the year. I've got my Starbucks coffee, gingerbread latte, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Like, add some of that in. Yeah, definitely. That sounded so much more exciting than just giving out the facts. There might have been something funny that happened to you on your journey. There might be a project that you've got at the craft fair that you're particularly excited about and you could highlight that. But yeah, it's adding all those little details that make things all the more appealing and all the more inviting. That's perfect. You did the job for me there, Sue. That was fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying. Okay. And I think for us, a little bit different and maybe easier. Well, I don't know, Heidi, you're going to tell me. Maybe easier than when you're writing. We have a concrete story that we have lived, so we can talk to it and then just add in some of those details so it feels like more, it feels more interesting. You have to create everything from scratch. It's all fiction, although you do pull from the past. So I'm thinking ours is a little bit easier if we just get used to adding in some more color and flair to our writing. I don't know, to be honest, because if I'm starting from scratch and I've got a completely blank canvas, I can paint on there whatever I like. So, you know, there are no limitations. So, yeah, I can kind of let my imagination go wild, at least to begin with, until my editor goes, uh, hang on. (laughs) (laughs) Let's rein that in a bit. That's a bit too much imagination. Does that ever happen? No, I don't think so. Not really. I mean, probably rewrites and stuff. I'm thinking as given that your work goes through a publisher, there's probably some additions or, well, share with us. That would be interesting. Let's start with the blank page because to a lot of us, that would be very intimidating. I'd rather have something started there than a blank page. How do you come up with your ideas and your next stories? Yeah, inspiration can kind of come from anywhere, really. And I think because I put two books out a year, the assumption is that you spend six months a year on the summer book and six months of the year on the winter book and everything happens within those six months. But actually, it isn't like that at all. The inspiration for Underneath the Christmas Tree, which is the book that's just come out, the inspiration for that actually came from, I don't know if you know, Country Living magazine. That's a magazine we have over here. Yeah, it's so beautiful. I've had a subscription to Country Living for, oh gosh, probably 20 years now, more than 20 years. And they had an article in there back in 2019 about a company who rented out Christmas trees every year. So you had a potted tree every year and they delivered it and they took it back and you got the same tree for so many years until it became too big. Um, And that idea kind of stuck in my head and I loved that. And that was what became the setting for Winter's Trees, which is the main setting in this book. That was back in 2019. So obviously that wasn't going to fit the six months time frame. But I kind of get the essence of the idea. And then at the moment, I'm writing in three different places. I've got the Windbridge series, the Windmouth series and the Nightingale Square series. So then I'll, I've kind of got the idea and then I'll have a think about which setting I think it would work best in. And then I kind of wait and see which characters are going to walk in. Sometimes it might be a character from a book that I've already written. Other times it might be somebody completely new, as in the case of this book, Liza Winter. She'd never featured in any of the books before. She kind of strolled in. And then it takes a few months, I guess, to kind of come up with the whole story. So I'm very much a plotter rather than a pantser. My editor and my agent, they need to see that kind of, that synopsis of what I'm going to write because they need to know when we're going to put it out there, how we're going to market it and all those things. And then when I've got the approval from them, then I can go on and start writing. And then it's a very intense, maybe 10, 12 weeks getting that first draft down. And it's the first raw draft that goes to my editor and to my agent so they can get a first look at it. And then we start working on it together from then. 
That is so interesting, just the behind the scenes of how this all works. And I'm thinking as we relate it to our listeners here, you've given us a really good clue. And that is you're getting inspiration from the world around you, from things that you see. And then you take that and you say, that's an interesting point, like the potted trees. And then you place it somewhere. Do you have like notes for the three different stages, if you will, where your stories reside? Then do you like have notes that you put down in those different areas where it will go so that then when it's time to look at that again, you've got all these ideas that you've brought together over the course of time? Yeah, I have a big A4 notebook and I'm always scribbling things in there for for different ideas that are going to work in different settings. That said, though, to be honest, these places are so real to me. I carry an awful lot of it around in my head. And when I had this idea for Underneath the Christmas Tree, I'd only previously written one book set in Winmouth, which was The Secret Seaside Escape, which came out last April, April 2020. And I just thought, oh, I would love to put a Christmas tree plantation near the coast, near the Norfolk, beautiful North Norfolk coast. But is that feasible? Is it going to work? And so that's when your research comes in. And yeah, I discovered actually we've got quite a few Christmas tree plantations in Norfolk and a few of them are near the coast because I didn't want to put these Christmas trees near the coast. And then somebody suddenly says, oh, you know, the growing conditions wouldn't be right or the landscape wouldn't be right. But yeah, it all fitted really beautifully. And once I'd got that, then I could develop the story and think about where I was going to set winter's trees and what it was going to look like and who was going to be there. I've got to tell you right now, I'm really jealous that you feel like you are always living in your stories because anyone who hasn't read any of those yet, so any of our listeners who haven't, when you start reading some of Heidi's books, they make you feel so good and you get so connected with all of the characters. And for you to say that you kind of live there all the time, I'm jealous, (laughs) I guess is what I have to say. Oh, I love that. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. I think, to be honest, in each and every one of these books, I have created a life for my main characters that I would absolutely love to live. I mean, who wouldn't want to live on an idyllic Christmas tree plantation? And who wouldn't want to run a beautiful cafe and do all of these things? It's kind of really self-indulgent on my part. I imagine myself as my main character and I guess I'm kind of living a different life through them really. And because I immerse myself in that, that's what hopefully makes it feel real to anybody who's reading the book when it comes out. It totally feels real. I'm so sad every time a book is done, which is why I have to have my stack that I know I'm going to. (laughs) So I'm really happy that you're doing at least two a year. No less than that. I'm telling you now, Heidi, no less. (laughs) Some people have been asking me, wishing that I would put out an autumn book. And we had a conversation about how lovely it would be to set an autumn book on on a pumpkin patch, on a pumpkin farm somewhere. I would love that. But there are the kind of like the timing restrictions in the publishing year of when it's suitable for me to put a book out. And of course, if I put a book out in the autumn that year, I wouldn't then put one out in Christmas. Right. So I need to I need to kind of go back to my agent and my editor and kind of have that discussion and see, oh, you know, maybe we should consider mixing things up a bit because I really want to write this pumpkin patch story now. <laughs> That's funny. Well, we're going to be watching to see if that happens. But you tell them no less than two. For sure. (laughs) Sue says, no less than two. (laughs) (laughs) And I want everyone to know, too, like we're talking about how feel good and how you just get to bond with the characters. I mean, I feel like they're my friends, too. But it's not without story and drama and emotion. That's for sure. So when I'm reading and I need to close the book because I've got to go cook dinner or whatever, and we're in the middle of some issue... I have to get right back to it afterwards because I need to know that everybody's okay before I go to sleep at night. I love that. I really appreciate that because that shows me that I'm doing my job well. If you're constantly wanting to get back, as far as I'm concerned, that's only a good thing. (laughs) It is a wonderful thing. And that is my whole point, that there is storyline to it that just brings you in and you are invested in what's going on in the story. So... I'm not going to say any more because I want people to go in and start reading your books. But you have a treat for us today, too. And that is you're going to read a little bit from the new book, right? Underneath the Christmas tree? I am. And I'm going to be a bit naughty. Don't tell anybody. Okay, we won't tell anybody. Normally, I would read the opening of the book. 
but quite often the opening of the book doesn't give you a flavour of what's going to happen further in. So in the opening of the book, Liza, she's at home, she's in her flat, she's just finished a maternity cover contract in a high school as an art teacher. And she didn't particularly enjoy it. And it's kind of given her the motivation, if you like, to decide that she wants to go off and go traveling. And then when she comes back to the UK, she's going to set up her art therapy business. But in the meantime, her dad, who has sadly died, her dad's silent business partner, David, has given her a call and said, I need to retire. You have to come back to the Christmas tree plantation because I want to hand it over to my son. She's got this dilemma. Is she going to go or isn't she? Well, obviously, we know she's going to go. I am giving you a little treat. So this is what happens during Eliza's journey to Winters. After my call to David, I spent the next few days dithering over my decision. But on Thursday, as planned, I loaded up my ancient car, which had been an 18th birthday present from Dad, and which I couldn't bring myself to trade in, even though it was becoming increasingly unreliable and set off for Winmouth on the North Norfolk coast. During the journey, and when I was tempted to turn back, I reminded myself that if I wanted to see my plans through properly, then this visit was the only option. However, rather than head straight to the lodge when I crossed the county border, I delayed the moment by taking a detour into the little coastal village. Ostensibly, it was to see if anything had changed, but in reality, it was to buy a few more minutes in which to mentally prepare. There were no new additions to Winmouth as far as I could tell, but what had always been there looked to my eyes at least a little more cared for. The village sign set in the green had recently had a fresh lick of paint and the shops around the edge appeared smarter too. The pub, Smugglers Inn, was sporting a different exterior colour and the row of brick and flint former fishermen's cottages which led down to the beach were in good repair. The sudden intrusion of another plethora of memories ensured I didn't linger, but instead wove my way back around the narrow lanes and out of the village, failing to spot the sea because the tide was too far out. As the road twisted and turned, I fell to wondering if winter's freeze was going to look as cared for as the village, and I didn't have to wait many minutes to find out. Well, that's new, I observed as I turned off the road and onto the drive. Welcome to Winters, I read aloud as I opened the passenger side window and leant across the seats to take in the personalised board which told visitors they'd arrived. The sign was well over eight foot high and featured a very jolly Santa, sleigh and reindeer soaring over what looked like the acreage owned by Winters trees. The artist had done a good job and I wondered how much it had cost to have a bespoke sign and designed and painted. I couldn't remember any email about it, but I knew I could have done it for a fraction of the cost. I put the car in gear, released the stubborn handbrake and carried on along the drive, which was now enchantingly flanked on either side by rows of tall red and white striped candy canes. They lit the way in the gathering darkness and like the sign weren't the only new additions. There was also a five bar gate blocking entry to the yard. But even if there hadn't been, I would have rolled to a stop at that point. Wow. I whispered, pulled up short by the sight of the lodge, which was on my left and set back amongst the trees. Tears pricked my eyes as I took it in and acknowledged that my memory had failed me. In my head, it was much smaller, and I'd forgotten how intricately carved and painted the barge boards which gave the place its authentic gingerbread feel, even in the height of summer, were. It was a home fit for Santa himself, and for a few years it had been mine. They might have been unhappier than I would have wished for but there was no denying the aesthetic was idyllic. The lights in the lodge were all switched on, giving the rooms a warm glow, and there was smoke curling out of the chimney. David had gone above and beyond to welcome me back, and my intensely emotional response to the sight of the lodge, which I had never formally felt any affection for, was a surprise. However, it wasn't quite as much of a shock as the piercing noise of an alarm which began to squeak when I tried to cover the gate. I covered my ears and took a hasty step back. My burgeoning tears banished as I looked about me, half expecting to see a police car racing up the drive. You were supposed to call, yelled a man's voice from the veranda a few seconds later. You were supposed to let me know when you were here and I was going to let you in. The guy, draped in a bath towel, which was far too small for his towering frame, pulled on a pair of work boots and ran over to where I was standing, open-mouthed and wide-eyed. He was at least a foot taller than me and thick-set, and there were a smattering of freckles covering his broad chest and shoulders. 
His hair was dark, or at least I assumed it was. It was hard to tell, really, because he'd clearly just jumped out of the shower and was sopping wet. When he turned around, I noticed that he'd got what looked like a pine tree tattooed down the length of his broad back. But it was difficult to make out the details in the harsh glare of my headlights, and already agog, I felt it would be rude to stare. There, he said, punching buttons on a keypad and thankfully silencing the noise. That's better. Much, I nodded in agreement, my ears ringing. You must be Liza Winter, he said, running one hand through his hair while the other held on to the precariously positioned towel. Yes, I nodded. I felt winded by the unexpected drama of my arrival and the proximity of his near nakedness. Yes, I am. I'm sorry about the noise. I hadn't realised the gate would be alarmed. There we go. I'm not going to tell you what happens no. next. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're leaving us in such a suspense. <laughs> it was quite a steamy introduction between those two. I love that. <laughs> I love it too. Well, first off, the place sounds amazing. It's clearly different than she had anticipated. So I'm sure she's going to learn a lot of new things, maybe some good, some bad. I don't know. I'm kind of yeah. telling you where you've left me and what my thoughts are. And clearly, there's going to be a relationship between those two. I don't know if it's a romantic relationship, a relationship with conflict about what's going to happen with the farm or what, but those are my thoughts. That's good. I like that. Yeah, they're good thoughts. I will just say sparks will fly. <gasps> Christmas sparks. Yeah, this book, it is jam-packed full of Christmas, and it was an absolute joy to write it. Oh, Okay, well, just FYI, it's already on the way to me. <laughs> so I may have to really quickly finish the book I'm already in so that I can get to the other one. You want to know what I'm reading right now? What are you reading at the moment? I'm reading Sunshine and Sweet Peas oh. in Nightingale Square. Oh, bless you. So that's the first Nightingale Square book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you know, it was nerve wracking writing that book because I had written, oh gosh, four, maybe five books set in Wimbridge, which is a different place. And I felt it was time to go somewhere new, but I was so scared to do it in case my readers didn't like it. It was a scary write, that one. Well, that's interesting. And I'm very anxious, too, because I don't know what's going to happen to the square. So Kate just jumped the fence, FYI. That's where I am. OK, so you're quite early on there. Yeah, maybe about a third of the way, something like that. I don't know. But yeah, very fun. <laughs> very, very fun. You guys, you've got to go and get this book now because you've got to find out what happens. And we got a demonstration beautifully, Heidi, of you adding in a lot of the detail. So we really understand what it looks like already, even with just that short section that you read. So that was a perfect example of what you taught us a little bit earlier here in terms of how to brighten up and add some pizzazz to our writing. Yeah, thank you. Because, uh, you know, if you're going to go and buy the, your Christmas tree and this place, Winter's Trees, it's a, it's a real tradition for the locals. So it's, I didn't want people to just turn off the road and go up the drive. You know, that wouldn't have been particularly interesting. But I kind of, I guess I just indulged my own fantasy of buying my own tree and kind of how exactly I would like it to look if I went there. It's a beautiful place and there are lots of things that happen there. There are going to be lots of additions to it. And it's just, oh, it's wonderful. Perfect place. I'm excited. So do you already have notes, like for a future book? Are you already writing notes? Well, actually, I mean, that was the second book set in Winmouth, And there is a character from this book that has really stuck in my head. Yeah, I have already started making notes about what her potential story could be. Mm, yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Being here on Christmas, and I am going to speak for all of your readers right now. You just bring us so much joy and happiness and an escape to our everyday life. What you're providing to us is just beautiful. I thank you so much for it, Heidi. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you. That really touches my heart. It makes my heart happy, as I have taken to saying, because, you know, lots of people tell me lovely things. Yeah, it really makes my heart thump that little bit harder to know how much books are being enjoyed, because they're an escape for me, too. You read them an escape, and I write them an escape. So it's kind of, it's a two-way relationship, really. You read them, which keeps me writing them, and I write them, which keeps you reading them. So thank you. Yes, perfect. And we're going to keep on with that for sure. Okay, so where can people go to get the books? 
Okay, well, in the UK, you can get them in all good bookshops or you can order them through all good bookshops if they're not on the shelves. And you can certainly get them through Amazon and other online retailers. And over there in the US, I am guessing that you should be able to get them on Amazon. That's something that people have been asking me about. And I know that people have been buying them over over where you are. So, yeah, I would have them look online. Yeah, and you can get them through Amazon. Now, I will tell you that the underneath the Christmas tree, if you just look under your author name, at least when I did it, it didn't show up. But when I put underneath the Christmas tree, then it showed up. So maybe it's just because it's new. Yeah, it could just be kind of like an Amazon glitch, maybe, if it was Amazon that you were looking at. Sometimes things take a little while, kind of be uploaded. When we release the title for the new book that's coming out next spring, We thought it was going to appear about four or five days before it actually went live. So I know there can be a delay on things like that. If you put the title in, it should definitely bring it up. So thank you. Yeah, it's definitely there because I just got three more books, actually. (laughs) So I've got my stack already going, the ones I've read, the ones that are waiting in line in order, like I said to you before. And then I just ordered three more because I had to get this one. So yes, you can absolutely go on Amazon and get it. And all your books are available in hard copy, Kindle, and Audible, I believe. Yes, yeah, all available in all formats now, which is fantastic. So nice and accessible for everybody. Yes. Okay, so I do have one last question about Underneath the Christmas Tree. The cover is pink. How did that happen? Wow, gosh. It's normally the second draft has gone in. So when I've written that first draft that we talked about earlier, that goes into my agent and editor. They come back with their notes and I do any work that needs doing. And it will be at that point when they have got the full measure of the story That's when they go to the publicity team and the art department and they start making, like they do the cover try. And the first cover that came back, it was different to the one we've got now. It was still pink and I loved it. But there were a couple of people who weren't quite so sure. So we also tried it in kind of like a mint color with red writing for the font. But the book that came out this spring, also a kind of shade of green and putting them side by side, I felt they looked too similar. And I was already in love with the pink cover. I was team pink right from the word go. So I was quite pleased that the other one didn't sort of meet up to what they were looking for, really. So we kind of, we tweaked it and we just thought, yeah, we're going to go with this. There is a thread in the story that will kind of make sense for that pink cover. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you what it is because I know you've not read it yet. You're such a tease. (laughs) It's really popped this year. There are so many more blue covers, blue, purple, dark green covers out at the moment. So this one is really kind of been quite unusual, I think. But it's beautiful and it's also festive, but it's definitely Christmas. Yeah, it still works really well. And the gold foils that they've got on there, I just love that. And the color of my name and everything. I Yeah. I think I always say this when a new book comes out, but I think it's my favorite cover, but I know that next year I'll be saying exactly the same thing. (laughs) It's got to be fun to see what they come up with on the creative end for the covers that match your stories. Yeah, it's a really interesting part of the process. And I think I'm really lucky with my publishing team. Some authors with other publishing houses, they don't get a say in their cover. They'll get told what the cover is going to look like and there is no room to change anything. But we work together as a really big team. So you've got myself and my agent, and then you've got the whole publishing team. We tweak it together. We come up with different ideas together. And I'm very fortunate in that I've never had a cover that I've thought, oh, I'm not so sure about that one. I've loved them all. Yeah, well, this one's beautiful. I'm definitely team pink with you, for sure. So one final question, and then I'm going to let you go carry on with your holiday. I love what you're putting up on Instagram. Is that coming from you or do you have a team that's putting up your social posts for you? Oh, that's something I've never been asked before, but it is something that has come up because I have Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And honestly, it takes me as much time working those social channels as it does writing the book. But it's a part of the job that I really enjoy. And a couple of years ago, the publishing team said to me, would you like some help with your socials? Would you like us to do a bit on your behalf? And I was like, no, absolutely not. Because I have a really good relationship with my readers and I try so hard to respond to everything, whether it's something I've posted and they've commented on or it's something that they've posted and tagged me in. 
I love that relationship and I love that opportunity to be able to connect. So yeah, absolutely everything comes from me. <laughs> and you show up regularly. I see you in my Instagram feed a lot. Do you have a certain amount of days that you're posting, like a true posting schedule, or do you just do it when the inspiration hits? I kind of dip in and out throughout the day. My day starts quite early. I wake up about five o'clock. So the first thing that I will do will be to turn my phone on, check my emails and see if there's anything I need to respond to on social media. And if there's something that I need to celebrate, say like there might be a publication anniversary or it might be Christmas and I've taken a nice picture of the tree that I want to upload, I will do that really early. And then if it's a writing day, I will put my phone to one side and I don't allow myself to look at it anymore until I've done a really good chunk of work and I have had my walk. Really important, I think, when you work on your own and you're in the house on your own all the time, you need to get out, you need to get that fresh air. So that's a really, really important part of my routine. So then I'll dip in again, maybe around lunchtime and have a catch up and then again late afternoon and again in the evening. So I'm always dipping in and out, but I find if I don't do that, I can't keep on top of everything. So I need to be present as often as I can be, but not to the detriment of my job, if that makes sense. No, that makes sense. You you compartmentalize things. So you'll look at your social media and then you'll put it aside, as you said, especially when you're doing your writing, you know, because you have to be so focused then. And then self-care, walking, always great, (laughs) you know, getting out, doing something. So that sounds amazing. Well, whatever you're doing, it is working. Like I said, I adore you. I adore what you're writing. Thank you so much for putting out in the world what you do. And Heidi, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope you all have an absolutely wonderful day. Merry Christmas, everyone. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y felicidad. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom.